In this video, I would like to discuss the physics of banked curves. In particular, why, if I'm in my car going around a corner, if the road were banked or at um, some angle inclined from the horizontal, why the banking allows my car to more safely or more quickly go around the corner that I'm trying to turn. And the incline that I have here uh, is showing a view from behind the car as it drives away from us into the screen. And perhaps uh, you can imagine the road turning to the left like this. So the car would be driving away from us into the screen and turning to the left. Let's first analyze the situation um, if there's no friction between the tires and the road, which is certainly a simplified case. But if that were true, then the car would only experience two forces. There would be a force up from the surface due to the contact between the tires and the road, and that would be a normal force that is perpendicular to the surface. And the other force that the car would experience would be a gravitational force between it and the earth that points straight down, and I'll label that mg, where the mass of the car is equal to m. Typically for inclined plane problems, we rotate the coordinate system so that there is a component of these forces that point perpendicular to the ramp and a component of the force that points parallel to the ramp. We typically uh, take the gravitational force and uh, split that into its parallel and perpendicular components relative to the inclined plane. But since this uh, car would be is driving in a circle, or at least momentarily as it's going through the, the turn, is driving in uh, a circle, then it must experience a centripetal or center-seeking force towards the center of the circle that it's traveling in. And even in the diagram that I have set up, that force would be a force directed to the left. So one of our coordinate axes should be pointing to the left, which would be in the direction that this object must experience a net force in order to travel in the circle that it would be traveling in. So I will call straight up the positive y direction and to the left the positive x direction. And so the next step from here would be to make sure that all of the forces in the free body diagram that I've drawn for the car align with the coordinate axes that I've selected. And so clearly the gravitational force would point in the minus y direction, but the normal force points uh, in neither, along neither one of the uh, coordinate axes. And so that should be split into its x and y components. And so one of those components uh, points in the positive y direction, and the other component points in the positive x direction, or to the left. So the first thing I'd like to point out is that for a car that's traveling along a banked road without friction, the component or force that provides the net force that points towards the center, which allows the circular motion of the car, would be the horizontal component of the normal force. And if the angle of the incline is theta, then the angle made in this triangle between the total normal force and the vertical component would also be theta. And so this angle here is also theta. And so the normal force has two components. The horizontal component is opposite that angle and would be equal to n sine theta. And the vertical component is adjacent to that angle and would be equal to n cosine theta. And so now, um, now that we've taken that force and split it into its vertical and horizontal components, I can write Newton's second law equations for the x and y directions. And so I'll start by writing an equation for the y direction. The net force in the y direction is equal to the object's mass times the object's acceleration in the y direction. And we know as long as the object is not driving towards the bottom or towards the top of the road, then the net force in the y direction should be zero. And so the upwards force n cosine theta minus the downwards force mg should be equal to zero. And that's how we know n cosine theta 
is equal to mg. A component of that normal force is responsible for supporting the weight of the car as it travels along that road. And now the same thing, but for the x direction, which is often, instead of x, referred to as the radially inward direction, right? So that way, as the car was traveling a moment later, the uh, coordinate axis was, would still point towards the center of the circle that the car is traveling in. But for now, the net force in the x direction is equal to the car's mass times the car's acceleration in that x direction. And in the x direction, the car only experiences one force, and that is n sine theta. And that force points in the positive direction. So I'll write a positive n sine theta equals the car's mass. And because the object is traveling in a curve, along a banked curve, then it is traveling in a circle, which means that the car experiences a center-seeking centripetal acceleration that is always equal to v squared over r, where r is the radius of curvature. So you could imagine, if viewed from above, there would be a certain radius of curvature where the center of the circle that the object is traveling in would be a distance r away. And the more sharp the turn, the smaller r is. And the less sharp the turn is, the bigger r is, the bigger the circle that it would be driving in would look like. And so I have two equations, one for the y direction and one for the x direction. And what I would like to do is combine these equations. And the purpose of combining those equations is to look at the speed that the car has to have in order to go around this curve safely. And so I'll combine these two equations by solving the first for the normal force, which would be mg divided by cosine theta. And I'll now take that expression and plug it in for n in, in the second equation. So instead of n, I have mg divided by cosine theta times sine theta equals, and the right side of the equation remains the same, m times v squared over r. And of course, on the left-hand side of the equation, we can see sine theta divided by cosine theta is equal to tan theta. So mg tan theta equals m v squared over r. And if we next notice that there's a mass on both sides of the equation, and multiply both sides of the equation by r, we can see that the speed of the car would be given by the square root of r g tan theta. And so what this equation represents, v equals the square root of r g tan theta, this equation represents the only speed with which the car could drive around the curved road. If you happen to be driving faster than the square root of rg tan theta, then the car would move up the banked road. And if the car is, uh, you know, if you're driving slower than the square root of rg tan theta, then it would move down. And so this is not a good situation, because if you're driving faster or slower than a very particular speed, your car would not be able to stay on the road. So clearly, friction plays a very important role in allowing the car to travel at different speeds as it goes around a banked curve, which is very important. However, the banking still plays an important role. Imagine if the road were not banked, if there was no friction, and the road were not banked. So theta would be equal to zero. You would quickly find that there is no speed or a speed of zero would be required in order for you to not go off the top or the bottom of the road. It's impossible to take a turn on a road without banking if there's no friction. And so, um, obviously when there is friction, the road doesn't have to be banked. And so now let's look at the case where we have friction and the banking in order to see how all of those things fit together. Let's now consider a banked curve with friction. And in particular, I'm going to consider the case where the speed is less than the square root of rg tan theta.
which could very easily be the case. So RG tan theta was the speed that we had to travel at if there was no friction in order to safely go around the bank. But now let's consider a case with friction where we're traveling at a speed less than RG tan theta. If our speed is too small than the prescribed speed based on the no friction case, then the car is going to want to slide down the inclination. Right? It's going to want to slide down the bank. And if that's the case, the, a friction force a, uh, will point up the bank. Right? So there should be a friction force that opposes uh, the falling of the car in order to keep it on the road safely. And so the car wants to slide down, but there's a static friction force between the tires and the road that's pointing up the ramp. And now let's see how that would affect our equations. Well, first of all, we had the vertical and horizontal components of the normal force, but now there would also be a horizontal and vertical component to the friction force. And so when I write my equation for the y direction, the net force in the y direction equals mass times acceleration in the y direction, there would be one additional force in that equation, and that would be the vertical component of the friction force. If the angle of inclination is theta, then the two angles that I'm marking in white are still equal to theta. And what that means for the net force in the y direction equation we not only have n cosine theta as a force that pointed in the positive y direction, but we also have F, the friction force, times sine theta pointing in the positive y direction. And, and of course, those two forces oppose the gravitational force, which points down. And so in this case, there is a vertical component to the normal force and a vertical component of the friction force that helps support the weight of the car. And now in the x direction, the net force in the x direction equals the mass times the acceleration in the x direction. Now in the x direction, we do have the component of the normal force n sine theta that points in the positive x direction. But now due to the friction force, there is an opposing force that points to the right, which would be minus f cosine theta, the component of the friction force that is adjacent to the small angle that I've drawn there in the free body diagram. And this is still equal to the car's mass times its centripetal acceleration, which is equal to v squared over r. And so here are two equations that once again could be combined in order to analyze what's going on with the speed of the car on a banked curve with friction. What I'd like to do from here is I'd like to do what we did before. I'd like to solve for the speed in terms of the other variables, but I'd like to eliminate the variable n in these equations. And so the way that I'm going to do that is I will take both the blue and green equations and solve them for n and then set them equal to one another. So I will start with the equation for the y direction. And first, I will recognize that the friction force, lowercase letter f, the friction force can be written as mu, the coefficient of friction between the tires and the road, times n, which is the normal force between the car and the road. And if I recognize that, then the blue equation for the y direction could be written as n cosine theta plus mu n sine theta equals mg. And so now, of course, both terms on the left-hand side have n in it, so I can factor that out. n times the cosine of theta plus mu times the sine of theta, that whole quantity is multiplied by n, equals mg. And so, of course, n equals mg divided by that quantity on the left, cosine theta plus mu sine theta.
And so that's one of two equations solved for n. I now need to take the green equation and do the same thing. And notice, just like the equation for the y direction, the f cosine theta term has f in it, which could be written as mu times n. So I'll start by writing n sine theta minus mu n cosine theta equals mv squared over r. And of course now I need to factor out the n's and then divide both sides of the equation by sine theta times mu cosine theta. So here n equals mv squared and in the denominator r times what would be left on the left hand side after I factor out the n which is sine theta minus mu cosine theta. And so here I have two expressions for the normal force which represent uh, the same thing in both cases and so I can set those equal to one another. And I could write this as mg divided by cosine theta plus mu sine theta equals mv squared over r times sine theta minus mu cosine theta. Once again, I'd like to solve this equation for the speed of the car, v. And so in order to do that, I'm going to do a couple steps here. I'm going to cancel the mass on either side because it only appears in the numerator of both sides of the equation. And then I'd have to multiply both sides of the equation by this mess in order to have the equation say v squared equals. I could then square root both sides of the equation. So I'll do that down below. I would get v equals the square root and in the numerator I would get r times g times sine theta minus mu cosine theta. And in the denominator, everything that was on the denominator of the equation on the left written in white, which is cosine theta plus mu sine theta. And everything is over the square root. And so the last thing I'd like to do is I'd like to compare these two equations. The equation for the case where the car does have friction between its tires and the road and the equation is solved for V and the equation that we solved for V where there was no friction. I'd like to compare these two equations. First I'd like to say that the equation in white for the friction case could be written like this the square root of rg times the square root of sine theta minus mu cosine theta divided by cosine theta plus mu sine theta. Exactly what I have written up above. I've just separated out uh, everything that was in the equation into two radicals. And what I notice about this equation is that it matches up beautifully with the equation we determined without friction. And I know this because if we consider the case where the coefficient of friction is zero and you look at the equation in yellow in the numerator and denominator the added or subtracted terms include mu. And so in the case that there was no friction these parts of those terms would go away. And once again sine theta over cosine theta would be equal to tan theta and so once again the equation for the speed of the car would be equal to the square root of r times g times the square root of tan theta. Hopefully this video was helpful for you understanding the physics of banked curves and how you might analyze a situation where there's no friction or a situation where there is friction. Hopefully you can also see that the more complicated case with friction reduces down simply uh, to the frictionless case by looking carefully at the equation.